Johnson. I'm now calling the March 10th, 2021 regular board meeting to order at 3.30 p.m. This meeting is being recorded. We would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral lands and traditional territories of the Puget Sound Coast Salish people. Ms. Wilson-Jones, the roll call, please. Director DeWolf. Present. Director Harris. Director Harris. It doesn't look like she's on the line yet. Um, Director Hersey. Here. Director Rankin. Here. Here. Director Rivera-Smith. Director Rivera-Smith. Present. And Director Hampson. Here. Do we have Director Harris yet? President Hampson, it sounds like all directors except for Director Harris are here. Okay, thank you. Superintendent Juneau is also joining us for today's meeting and additional staff will be briefing the board as we move through the agenda. As we begin this meeting, I would, would also like to welcome Fatima Garcia, who is joining us as the student representative from Cleveland High School. We will be hearing from Fatima later in the meeting as well as fellow Cleveland High School student Mia Dabney who will be leading off our testimony list. This meeting is being held remotely consistent with the governor's proclamation and open pub on open public meetings. The public is being provided remote access today by phone and through SPS TV by broadcast and streaming on YouTube. To facilitate this meeting I will ask all participants to ensure you are muted when you are not speaking. Staff may be meeting participants to address feedback and ensure we can hear directors and staff. I will now turn it over to Superintendent Juneau for her comments. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, President Hampson. Um, and today's comments, I just want to acknowledge that tomorrow, March 11th, was the last day that students in Seattle Public Schools um, were receiving in-person instruction. And at that time, I for one, um, took in-person instruction for granted. And after being in a remote learning stance for one full year, I'm constantly reminded of the important role that public education plays in the lives of students, families, and the community as a whole. And I really just look forward to the day that our schools are again bustling with sounds of students and staff. In the meantime, teams across the district um, that have been working hard to get schools and staff ready for the return to in-person instruction for our students in the special education intensive pathways and in pre-K um, have been really rising to the challenge. As you know, we are working in partnership with our labor partner, SEA, to finalize an MOU. The plan is that some students in the special education intensive pathways and our pre-K students will return to in-person school on March 29th, and those staff affiliated with um, those students will return on March 22nd. I do want to give a shout out to Dr. Codd, Dr. Pedroza, and Chief Berge, and the rest of the bargaining team as they continue to work long hours in service of our students. They continue to be at the table even as we speak um, with SEA so that we can start returning to schools. And if people are interested in our in-person plans, including our health and safety protocols, our top 10 list of things families need to know, videos on mask wearing and so so much more it is all on our website we'll continue to roll information out as it gets developed and i just really also want to thank our communication team who are working in overdrive to produce so much content and make sure our families stay informed during our retreat last weekend um, chief podesta made note of something i thought was pretty significant um, that there are leaders emerging every day at the john stanford center um, and that's true, we see it all the time. We have so many staff stepping up to do big things and small things that really are making a difference. And although we're in the midst of navigating a global pandemic, our staff have been keeping their ever shifting work going. Um, teams continue to collaborate, so our strategic plan focus is not lost. And so much is being lifted on a daily basis. I'm just really thankful for our staff never losing sight of what's important and doing everything they can in service of families and students. Uh, small Cabinet and I would like to give a special shout out to the following staff. Fred Griffin, Chris Dillon, Stu Larimore, 
They led preparing our buildings, including all those HVAC um, checks and established the cleaning protocols. Mike Wells and Benjamin Coulter from Safety and Security stepped up time and time again to help with walkthroughs. Um, they were delivering supplies last time I was at John Stanford, um, putting up signs in schools and all the things that had to um, take place. Hunter Maltese, Ellen Rays, and first student um, brought back yellow bus transportation and developed all kinds of routes for students. The special education and early learning staff, they've worked so hard at collaboration and coordinating throughout this uncertain time, um, even down to making individual calls to families so they understood what was actually happening. Um, the contingency planning team who had to uplift things so quickly and pivot their work streams in preparation for this week. Audrey Kearns, Devin Cabania, Antoinette Harrison, Mike, uh, Marcel Hauser, Rivka Burston Stern, and Natalie Williams. And again, thanks to our athletics department for lifting up the Metro League on February 22nd. It's really great to see kids out there playing sports um, and being happy about it. Our preschool team who created preschool activities and lessons for our youngest learners. Thank you, Tisha Crumley, Sharon Geary, and Angie Swartz. Uh, preschool operations, Michelle Flannell and Pam Goldfein. Cashel Toner um, for her leadership charge for remote learning and planning for return, returning in person. Heather Brown, our pre-K return to in-person and remote instruction and operations and pre-K K start of school date shifts in support of families impacted by Rosh Hashanah. Thank you to the teams who did school walkthroughs this week, including Richard Stout, Fernando Luna, and Trina Sturk, who supported uh, the labor and industry visits. That went really well. Mary Sue Heffernan, Meg Carlson, John McDonough, and Jill Eckert for their work in health and safety and helping with case tracking and PPE distribution. Pat Sander and Carrie Nicholson, Mary Wong, Shauna Adelman and Sharon Mietta for their help with re-entry and safety protocols, our elementary directors of schools for walking through and preparing those 42 school sites this week. And as always, the risk of giving gratitude and shout outs is that we will miss someone and I'm, we miss so many. Um, but the ones I mentioned are representative of all of our staff. Um, and please know that all district staff are working hard to ensure schools and staff are ready for students for re to return for in-person instruction and people can continue to stay informed of our progress by checking out our website. And just thank you. Grateful to be here and grateful for all of you. Thanks so much. Okay, again, I would like to welcome Cleveland High School student um, Fatima Garcia. Fatima is a senior at Cleveland High S Cleveland STEM High School. Uh, Fatima, am I saying your name correctly? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Fatima has been in ASB since freshman year and is now the ASB president. Fatima is also the student representative on Cleveland High School's building leadership team. I will turn it over to you now, Fatima, for your comments. Thank you. So first, I want to say that I'm excited to be here and represent Cleveland High School. Um, as we all know, it's been almost a year since we went into lockdown in a virtual setting of learning, which has been a challenging experience for all of us. Some challenges that students have faced and are continuing to go through is adapting to a more relaxed and independent environment. I say this because virtual learning is the complete opposite of having an everyday in-person schedule that high schoolers have done for more or less 12 years. And we're doing it in the comfort of our homes, which in itself is hard. Students face the limitations of doing learning through teams and the technological aspects that students and families face. But online learning has been hard on all of us, admin, teachers, students, and families. And I thank all of the teachers, staff, and administrators at Cleveland for the relentless hours they spend planning academics and events for, uh, events for extra support for students, which I'm sure all schools are doing. Being on Cleveland's BLT has allowed me to see the extra efforts that are being made and want to be made for all of our students' success in virtual learning. The pandemic has affected everyone differently, and with doing online learning, there are many responsibilities that students have gained. Um, as we continue doing online learning, it's important to create resources for students' mental health needs. I know at Cleveland, we have restorative justice, advisory. Um, students can schedule meetings with counselors as well. 
And also as a student, creating a strong school community is important and using the tools that we have like social media to the fullest. As a senior, it's been hard doing college applications on my own, but our counselors have done drop-in sessions for FAFSA and WAFSA help, virtual alumni student panels and resources and opportunities that are always being sent through email, which has made planning for post high school education easier. As plans begin to be made for next school year, whether it's online or in person, making sure there are resources created so that the transition can be smooth and all students have the tools for success. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, please feel free to um, speak up at any point during uh, our sessions if you have any comments or, or questions. OK, we've now reached the consent portion of today's agenda. May I have a motion for the consent agenda? Yes, I move for approval of the consent agenda. Second. This has been moved by Director Hersey. Uh, sorry, approval of the consent agenda has been moved by Director Hersey and seconded by Director Rivera-Smith. Do directors have any items they would like to remove from the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The consent agenda has passed unanimously. Uh, let's see, we've now reached the public testimony, uh, not quite to 345. So we're going to be taking uh, public testimony Let me actually use these next three minutes. Would any directors like to give their committee reports uh, while we, um, in order to get us past that 345 mark to begin our public testimony? Yeah, I can go ahead and give our President committee Hansen. report. Oh, uh, go ahead, Director DeWolf. Sorry, Director Hersey. Um, mine is just to say our operations committee meeting is tomorrow. Um, we have a bunch of board action reports related to um, BEX-5 construction projects, as well as uh, an elevator maintenance um, bar, one for our fresh fruit and vegetable program, and then one to rename the Southwest Athletic Complex to the Nino Cantu Southwest Athletic Complex. And that's, um, our, our, our schedule is packed tomorrow with construction bars. So it is, it is just that if people want to attend. Okay, thank you. Director Hersey. Uh, the quick committee report for the Audit and Finance Committee is that our next meeting is on March the 15th. And this past week, we had the pleasure of interviewing three candidates for our public advisor role and just wanted to extend a huge thank you to all of those candidates who applied. And we are excited about moving forward um, and notifying folks soon. So thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Okay, any other directors want to yeah. give a brief? Yep. I can give mine pretty brief since we um, also are in the cycle where the next um, student services curriculum and instruction meeting is next week on Tuesday at 4.30. Um, and uh, we'll have an update on the isolation and restraint policy, um, among some other things. Uh, we had um, an ethics studies work session. Was that just last week? Time is time is moving in very bizarre ways right now. Um, and that for folks who weren't able to join that, um, that that'll be that wasn't a one and done kind of thing. We'll have more parts as that work progresses, and um, and staffing around that comes together. So that's exciting, um, and we'll be receiving more. Uh, updates on that also through committee, although I don't I don't think next week, but um, um, yeah, we're trying to keep focused on on this, the stuff that needs to happen now. Um, go, uh, going towards the plan for that's due to the state in June and then in planning for fall too. That's pretty much it. Tuesday at 430. 
Okay, and uh, the executive committee. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Let me just note um, that Director Harris um, joined us at 3.32 p.m. And executive committee meets uh, similarly to the other uh, committees. Um, hasn't met since we last met, so we meet uh, next week on the 17th. Uh, we will be discussing a number of planning topics including our process for approach to planning for next year. And I don't know that there's anything um, else uh, particularly notable on the, the agenda. That certainly is, is, is plenty. Um, we uh, meet at 8 a.m. Okay. President Hansen, can I add one more thing? Yes. Thank you. Um, I just, I was going to mention it in board comments, but it actually is more appropriate right now in committee comments. Some exciting news on the um, outdoor and community schools task force. We have finalized selection for that task force. And um, it's really exciting. A lot of great partners and educators and community members. And 58% um, of the final task force applicants identify as BIPOC, Black and Indigenous people of color, and 64% of these applicants that were selected identify as Seattle residents of central or south and southwest city areas. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that as uh, just a really exciting and um, uh, kind of validation of the commitment that we have in this work of uh, centering students of color and making this an initiative that benefits uh, all of the students of Seattle with a specific focus on those for this, from educational justice. So just wanted to share that and there will be more updated on the website. Um, you said Southwest, did you mean Southeast? South, South slash Southwest. Oh, okay. Um, okay, we will now go, next go to public testimony. We'll be taking public testimony by teleconference today as stated on the agenda. For any speakers watching through SPS TV, please call in now to ensure you're on the phone line when your name is called. Board Procedure 1430BP provides the rules for testimony, and I ask that speakers are respectful of these rules. I will summarize some important parts of this procedure now. First, testimony will be taken today from those individuals called from our public testimony list, and if applicable, the waiting list, which are included on today's agenda posting on the school board website. Only those who are called by name should unmute their phones and only one person should speak at a time. Speakers from the list may cede their time to another person when the list speaker's name is called on. The total amount exceeds two minutes for the combined number of speakers and time will not be restate, restarted after the new speaker, speaker begins. In order to maximize opportunities for others to address the board, each speaker is allowed only one speaking slot per meeting. If a speaker cedes time to a later speaker on the testimony list or waiting list, the person to whom time was ceded will not be called to provide testimony again later in the meeting as there is only one speaking slot per person. Those who do not wish to have time ceded to them may decline and retain their place on the testimony or wait list. Finally, the majority of the speaker's time should be spent on the topic they have indicated they wish to speak about. Ms. Wilson-Jones will read off the testimony speakers. Thank you, President Hampson. Um, speakers, please remain muted until your name is called to provide testimony. When your name is called, please be sure that you have unmuted on the device you're calling from and also press star six to unmute yourself on the conference call line. Each speaker will have a two minute speaking time and a chime will sound when your time is exhausted. Then um, the first speaker on today's testimony list is Mia Dabney. OK, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Hello, my name is Mia Dabney and I'm a junior at Cleveland High School. I'm here to speak on policy 1250 and the importance of restorative justice. I have said this before and I will say it again. We cannot have conversations about youth without youth involved in those conversations. Our education and our future can't be determined without us. There's a quote by, Angel by Angela Davis that is incorporated into the policy. Walls turn sideways are bridges. By, pass, by passing policy 1250, we can create a safe bridge between educators, specifically the school board and students. At Cleveland, 
At Cleveland, students, teachers, and families have access to restorative justice circles to address issues. We have two fully trained and dedicated circle leaders to support our community. We have the circle. Um, we have the circles um, when one of the leaders take on the specific issue. Then they meet with each party to hear both perspectives and hear what each per each person person needs to know to feel like trust and respect is restored. Restorative justice is important because it helps people understand the harm in their actions, but it also helps students and adults learn about each other's perspectives to build a better understanding of others. These circles are so important because it helps youth learn to have empathy and be possibility thinkers to be able to have fuller connections with others. My hope for SBS is that we implement restorative justice practices and circle leaders into all schools to better support students. Thank you so much. Ms. Wilson-Jones? The next speaker is Eric Anthony Sousa Ponce. Hi, my name is Eric Anthony Sousa Ponce. I use he, him pronouns, and I am a senior at Ballard High School. At Ballard High School, I am the co-president of Students and Teachers Against Racism, and I am also a representative of the NAACP Youth Council. I'm testifying today on behalf of policy 1250, which is to get black and brown youth on the school board. I'm going to start off with some statistical information here. In the state of Washington, black and brown youth make up 47% of uh, the students in the state. That means that nearly half of the students in the state of Washington are students of color. Meanwhile, 89% of the teachers in the state of Washington are white. That means that only one in every 10 teachers is a teacher of color. The school board represents all students and teachers and seeks to make the best environment possible for everyone. But the only consistent input from black and brown youth who make up half of the students in the state come from outside organizations, such as the NAACP Youth Council, who I am presenting for today. It would be much more beneficial for all parties involved if the students of color could have a more active and consistent voice in the school board to help make these difficult decisions that will have a drastic impact on us. This is why we need black and brown youth on the school board. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Leah Scott. Leah Scott. Hi everyone, my name is Leah Scott and I'm a senior at Roosevelt High School. I'm also the student president of North Seattle College via Running Start. I'll be advocating for the passing of policy two, um, 1250, which would allow students on the school board. When I think of all the reasons this policy should be passed, two main things come to mind. First, in, first involving us looking at the current situation that we are in, Students, teachers, administrative leaders are all stuck in this online work environment. From my per perspective as a student, meetings, meetings are filled with cameras off, muted, and barely chatting. We need to be innovative and bold with how we engage our students in the classroom, especially in these uncertain times. Having a student perspective in the room where real change happens in our school district is essential and allows us to make a school district that is heavily catered to what students want and need, which is how it should be. By doing so, we can hear more students speak about what really needs to change in our classrooms in order to make an online learning environment that is engaging and inclusive. Only students and under, truly understand the impact and the weight of decisions that are made by school board members, which is why they need to be in these discussions about waiving regulation requirements or not allocating resources across the school district. Another big part of this is that Seattle Public Schools in general could do better including youth voice and decision making. We need to create a district that is, not, that is willing to not just make decisions for the youth, but with the youth. And implementing this policy is a big step towards that goal. I would also like to add that this policy is one that was created not only by students, but in partnership with Zachary DeWolf and Ronald Boy. We went to every single school board member individually and got feedback from them. This policy is one that symbolizes the beautiful partnership between students and adults. I believe that as a community, we should recognize that beauty and honor it by passing this policy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. Next is Chris Jackins. Chris 
Chris Jackins. My name is Chris Jackins, Box 84063, Seattle 98124. On school board student members, the students will be chosen by the board. No elections. The dictators of Myanmar would probably love this plan. Please vote no. On BTA 5, capital levy. Don't remove trees, don't shrink playgrounds, don't bulldoze grass play fields. Provide books, not just software. Otherwise, vote no. On renaming Northgate Elementary, four points. Number one, the district wants to bulldoze Northgate, shrink its playground, and then rename it for a famous person. The district has applied this cynical strategy before. Number two, the district idiotically sold the original Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary. It tried to cover it up by renaming Brighton Elementary as Martin Luther King Jr. Number three, the district idiotically bulldozed the landmark Wilson Pacific site and evicted its Native American programs. It tried to cover it up by renaming the site for a Native American principal. Number four, the district idiotically lost track of its own history with respect to Sharpless School. The district tried to cover it up by renaming the site for an Asian American teacher. Please vote no on the Northgate name change. On the $3 million Cleveland Forest easement, two points. Number one, trees will be removed to install a trail and a parking lot and for any other reason King County decides. The report does not reference a public hearing. Number two, the district should not be selling off long-term assets. Please vote no. On COVID-19 safety, it seems like board voting on actions to return to in-person instruction should be done at in-person board meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. Next is Sean Alice Hubbard. Sean Alice Hubbard. My name is Sean Hubbard. I'm a neighbor and graduate of Northgate Elementary School. Most of what I have to say is in the letters I recently submitted to you. As you see in the signed letter, other graduates and neighbors have joined me in asking that our school's Northgate name be retained. We should have been included in the discussion. We would like to keep our Northgate name, period. This is an argument for something and not against a particular name. For you to change our argument into anything other than that is to use a form of silencing. The Northgate name that is so dispensable to you carries significant meaning to us. We have Northgate pride. Sadly, that pride is lacking within the school walls today, so much so that the school's own staff would prefer the bulldozer and a new name for a clean slate. If you want to change the school, be the change and teach the change. A new facade or a new name won't do that. Change needs to come from within. James Baldwin has your admiration. Now his family is due your respect. You say you attempted to contact them, but the Baldwin family is notorious for saying no to any usage rights, and the fact that you had planned to proceed without their permission is not right. I asked them because they are owed this common courtesy. As you will read in the documents, this is their reply. With regard to the school and naming it after Mr. Baldwin, we have received similar requests in the past and have respectfully declined. Respectfully declined is their very polite way of saying no. Please show your respect to James Baldwin and his family by not naming our school or any school after him. There are many more meaningful ways to honor him. Teach the children his words, the ideas behind them, and how to live his principles. And we ask you to keep our, keep our school, but make it better, and keep the Northgate name, but make it proud again. Thank you. Ms. Wilson-Jones. Next is Scott Mayer. Scott Mayer. Scott Mayer, if you are on the line, you need to press star six to unmute. Scott Hello. Mayer, go ahead, Scott. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is Scott Mayer. Uh, I, I just recently became aware of the plans for renaming Northgate Elementary School. And uh, I'm, 
this seems like a misguided renaming uh, uh, um, that goes, uh, sorry for not being more articulate about this, <clears throat> but stage fright. Uh, because North, the, one of the primary reasons that they say they want to rename it is because it had, over the years, gotten a bad reputation. That's how they is put in what I read of the support letters. And as a neighbor, I never thought that. Uh, that I think it has a, um, it has it addresses a population of mm, first generation Americans, and so they have a difficult challenge. And I've always thought that from the outside, that it seemed like they do a very good job. To, so they already decided they were going to um, uh, remove, demolish the building, which um, for all the neighbors and all the students that um, have gone there, it's essentially, it's quite a price to pay that essentially saying your school was bad, uh, and so we're getting rid of it. So that's all their memories. Okay, that was, so they're building a new school, giving a, a, a new name. And essentially, completely um, completing the uh, the pretending like that never happened, as I understand it, and it seems uh, that's quite a um, uh, collateral damage that they're doing to all the residents up to this point. Uh, they have gone to that the students, um, they have gone to it there, and their parents. Uh, <clears throat> if you think back on your, that's how you reflect on your school. It's probably with pride. And I think a better than New York State School. It would um, accomplish a lot rather than completely eliminating its history. Thank you, Ms. Wilson Jones. Right. Next is Emily Jerkin. Emily Jerkin. My name is Emily Cherkin. Tomorrow marks one year that thousands of children have been learning remotely in Seattle. I am astonished that after a year, this body has been enabled to figure out a viable solution to get children back in person in some capacity. Focusing on issues like renaming schools or clean energy resolutions 40 years from now is like being on the Titanic and deciding to change the tablecloths in the dining room. I'm disgusted by the lack of leadership in this okay. district. You ask teachers to return to the classrooms, which I support with CDC measures safely implemented, but how convenient for you to continue to meet remotely. If these meetings were held in person, frustrated constituents would fill the room and you would be forced to face them. The district asks for feedback on a new website, but has not yet surveyed families of two through 12th graders about parents' intent to send kids back. For the fall, I presume, since I have no confidence that these children will be returning to classrooms before then. How are families supposed to plan for this? Outdoor learning in a city like Seattle should be a no-brainer. Yet teachers, teacher, teachers teacher, who applied teacher to be on the Outdoor Education, education Committee in October only recently <laughs> were informed that committee, committee members <laughs> were not yet determined. This is appalling. Your outdoor learning resolution in August has still not established a functioning committee in March, seven months later. I have testified now three times in the past six months about my concerns relating to FERPA. On January 21st, I sent a letter requesting a copy of my son's education re records pursuant to FERPA, including but not limited to Google Classroom and Schoology. On January 28th, District Council responded saying they do not consider the records defined below to be education records. Please help me understand. How are these not considered educational records when there are, these are providers contracted by the school to provide educational services? I replied on February 1st with this very question and have yet to receive a response, so I am putting it here on the record. Until I hear otherwise, I can only assume the district is in violation of FERPA. Thank you. Ms. Wilson-Jones. Next is Dr. Fiona Goodchild. Dr. Fiona Goodchild. Hello, my name is Fiona Goodchild. I've been an educator for almost 50 years, and I have practical experience as a high school teacher, a community college instructor, and a program director. And I've worked extensively with middle and high school teachers to make changes that engaged all students and prepared them for success in high school math and science courses. This project, the Science Partnership for School Innovation, worked well to improve student performance in Central California and was one of the reasons I received a presidential award for excellence in mentoring, science, engineering, and math. That was in 2002. 
So I have experience with the value of education for students from disadvantaged families. And I'm astonished that the Seattle School Board is finding is failing these very students by closing schools. The impacts I will now discuss were documented in an article by Nicholas Kristof in the New York Times on February 25th. Closing schools widens the economic and racial gap as underserved students fall further behind. Many have essentially disappeared as they no longer log in for classes. Some have no internet access or the support needed to help them complete online assignments. Dropouts are increasing, and this will mean a lack of educated workers in this community for years to come. And right now, I do not have the time to talk about the family despair and destruction that these school closed schools are causing. Of course, private schools are open to offer more advantage to the privileged, and even cash-strapped parochial schools are providing personal contact. Why not Seattle Public Schools? You're failing to prioritize students and need to re reopen schools as soon as possible. Thank you. Ms. Wilson-Jones. Next is Todd Sawicki. Todd Sawicki. Todd Sawicki. Todd, if you're on the line, you need to press star six to unmute. Moving to the next speaker, Robin Reed. Robin Reed. Hello, my name is Robin Reed. I am the parent of a sixth grader. I am asking the board and the district to lay out a timeline for bringing back all students to in-person instruction at least part-time this year. A return this year would let students begin learning how to function in a greatly altered school environment. It would allow teachers, families, and administrators to identify the systems that work and those that need improvement over the summer. It would provide an invaluable jump start on the hard work that we will all need to do to return to in-person classes rather than pushing all that off and having students back in September who haven't been in a school building in 18 months. Most importantly, it would begin to give our kids a glimpse of normalcy again, the chance to see friends, the chance to make friends, the chance to learn from a teacher in person, the chance to socialize and play and receive services in a setting expressly designed for them, the chance to, as much as possible, be normal kids again. I come to you as a parent of a sixth grader who really struggled at Eckstein Middle School this year. Online school for him was work, stress, and a demand for focus for hours every day with absolutely none of the interaction, spontaneity, or fun of in-person school. Despite his efforts, ours, and his teachers, it has been a disaster. I sincerely worry that he will never want to learn again. We withdrew him from Seattle Public Schools two weeks ago, and we're not alone. Just in September, over 400 students in kindergarten through 12th grade have left Seattle Public Schools. The highest percentage has been students in sixth grade and ninth grade, the transition years. We can start bringing students back in person safely now, just like every large school district in America. Why would we possibly wait another six months to get our kids back to a setting where they can see and interact with each other? We owe it to them to do it as soon as we possibly safely can. And if that means just a few weeks this year, that's still vastly better than not even trying. Thank you. Ms. Wilson-Jones. Next is Anne Goodchild. Anne Goodchild. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. I'd like to ask that you work with a greater sense of urgency and transparency regarding the return of students to classrooms so as to address the multiple educational and public health crises created by a year of online instruction. I'd like to call your attention to a letter written this week on behalf of the Washington chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics to Governor Inslee, and I quote, children are suffering and in many cases the harm may be irreparable. 
for developing kindergartners or adolescents who attempt suicide. For many Washington children, keeping them out of school any longer will result in gaps to their educational attainment, which they may not be able to overcome in their lifetime. Schools provide essential time for children to be together, to socialize, and to develop emotionally, as well as food for hungry children and support for struggling families. We now have a public health crisis secondary to keeping kids out of school. Emergency rooms are overflowing with children and teens in mental health crises, and tragically, pediatric ICUs are serving suicidal adolescents in unprecedented numbers. All these profound losses and risks can be mitigated or even overcome if we simply get kids safely back to school as quickly and as frequently as possible. Again, that was an excerpt from a letter written on behalf of the Washington a chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics to Governor Inslee. They offered to help with training within just two weeks. This week, you again delayed a date for in-person instruction for preschool and intensive service pathways to March 29th and can provide families with no expectations for when any other students will return to the classroom. As a parent of two Seattle Public Schools high school students, I have no idea what the timeline is for decision-making or what the fall will look like for my children. I have no idea when you will tell me what to expect. You repeatedly claim to be working in the best interest of students, and your mission statement maintains that you are committed to ensuring equitable access, closing the opportunity gaps, and excellence in education for every student. Yet every day you fail to bring students back, you are Thank exacerbating you. the very inequities you were elected to address. Thank you. Ms. Wilson-Jones? Next is Anya Sousa Ponce. Hi, my name is Anya Sousa Ponce. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a freshman at Ballard High School, and I work with the NAACP Youth Council. Ballard, my school, recently conducted an internal survey of the entire staff and student body and found that only 13.6% of students and staff of color at Ballard felt the school and administration is doing an adequate job of intervening in instances of racial abuse at the school. Now, if only 13.6% of students and staff of color feel safe at our school, and if, as Eric Anthony said earlier, if only one out of 10 students in Washington is a, or, sorry, if only one out of 10 teachers in Washington is a person of color, then the 86.4% of students at Ballard who do not feel that our school leadership makes a safe environment for people of color a priority, that 86.4% of students of color need a direct connection to the school board meeting or school board who does want to prioritize our safety. The board has already shown this as a matter of importance with policy 0030 and hopefully you will be able to take it a step further with 0040 later this year. But the piece that is missing there is going to be student representation, which is what policy uh, 1250 addresses. Nothing about us without us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. Next is Anne Hennessy. Anne Hennessy. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, OK. Uh, yes, my name is Anne Hennessy, um, and I am uh, speaking today about uh, reopening schools. I have actually sent this in an email both to the school board and to the and to SEA um, have not received a response, but would like to read this here. Um, I'm the parent of a third grader in this district with a five year old ready to start kindergarten in the fall. I support public education. I support unions and the right to collective bargaining. I'm writing to express my extreme frustration with the inaction, lack of urgency and ability to find agreement between the union and the school district. Like many parents, I stood behind the push to get educators and SPS employees vaccinated, even ahead of other essential workers, like my own daycare provider who had never closed her doors during this pandemic. It was the right thing to do for our community as a whole. To see day after day, no sign of compromise and very minimal movement is infuriating. You claim to have the best interests of our children in mind, but every week of remote school, I see more and more children literally disappear from my child's class. 
I see my own child losing interest in school, flipping in subjects where she had once been strong, and the amount of engagement with our school community decline each week. When I learned in August that Seattle Public Schools would begin this year remote, I was overwhelmed. It was hard in the spring, and I believed, however, that this was the right choice. We had no vaccine, limited PPE, failed leadership at the national level, and a lack of data for how COVID spread in schools. Through fall, with cases spiking, even though it was hard, I supported staying the course, but we are now in a place where we have a vaccine. We are getting our educators vaccinated. We have the lowest case levels of nearly anywhere else in the country, and we know how to protect ourselves and others, and we have data to prove it. Every other facet of our society has taken steps to move forward, and it's time for us to get our kids back into the classroom. I'm not asking anyone to be forced back who doesn't want to go, and I'm not asking that building, buildings reopen in full immediately and go back to normal immediately. I'm not asking you to cut corners on any of the safety measures recommended by the CDC. I'm pleading that you get together and look past biases and find common ground just as we teach our kids to do. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Wilson-Jones. Um, returning to Todd Sawicki. Todd Sawicki, are you on the line now? Todd, if you're on the line, you need to press star six to unmute. President Hampson, that was our final speaker on today's list. Thank you, Ms. Wilson-Jones. Okay, we now move to the action items on today's agenda. We will move now to action item number one, a motion to adopt board policy number 1250, school board student members and, am and amend board policy Number 1240, committees. May I have a motion for this item? Absolutely. The ever pressing mute button. <clears throat> Excuse me. I move that the school board adopt board policy number 1250, school board student members, and amend policy number 1240, committees as attached to the board action report. Second. This item has been moved by Director Hersey and seconded by Director Rivera-Smith. Now to directors for any comments, questions, or concerns on the item before we move to the votes. And I will start with uh, Director Hersey um, as one of the leads on the, one of the sponsoring leads on the item and um, executive committee um, member and vice chair. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I am just, again, I have sung the praises of the youth that have worked on this policy pretty thoroughly. Um, they continue to excel. Many of the same youth are helping us uh, facilitate and think through our um, forum to find our next uh, board colleague to succeed Director Mack. And I think that that just shows the undying commitment that these youth have to not only engaging with our system, but also stepping up and, and leading it when they have the opportunity to do so. So what I would just say is I am incredibly excited to move forward. I think that this is long overdue um, and I will turn it over to the next director, but very excited and very, very hopeful uh, that this passes tonight. You're still on mute, President Hampson. Thank you. I'm going to now go to the bottom of the order to um, hear from Director Dwolf. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Hampson. And thank you for that um, uh, quick uh, grounding in context, um, Vice President Hersey. Um, I do want to just make sure just to really highlight the incredible work of the NAACP Youth Council and Leah and Mia and all the other youth. Um, uh, because this really actually felt like a, a wonderful um, example of our students and our boards and the adults coming together to create something meaningful that will hopefully have an impact for you know many generations to come. Um, I also want to just um, really reiterate that uh, any comparisons to this by our community to Myanmar are offensive and shameful. And I am so proud to stand by this work and this collaboration between the students and the board. Um, but that's unfortunately the level of discourse we're dealing with. Um, 
but I actually just see this policy and the work that's been done over the course of the last few months as really positive. Um, as you can see in the policy, we're looking for three students um, to support our uh, operations, audit and finance, and student services, curriculum and instruction policy committees. And, you know, as we talk about on the board a lot, much of the work takes place in committees um, before that the, the bars or the, or the resolutions move up to the full board. And so I'm really, really excited and eager to see um, the types of conversations and the analysis that will come by including student voices in the decision making um, and consideration process. Um, I also just want to give a special shout out not only to Vice President Hersey for his help and support and work on this, but also to our senior uh, legal senior general counsel Ronald Boy, uh, who really did the Yalman's work on this, um, dedicating many time, many evenings and off hours, and just a ton of time creating this thing in the best interest of our students, because at the end of the day, that is who we're here for. Um, I think the one question we had last time is about procedure, and so you know. The procedure will come after this. We look forward to building that out and uh, supporting that process. But I think today the best thing we can do is, is move this forward. We're not the first district in the state to do this. In fact, we're well behind the first. Um, it's been done all over the state where there's student reps on board. And so um, I'm just really excited for the, this district, the largest district in the state, to move forward on this policy. So thank you for letting us uh, bring this forward. Thank you, Director Rankin. Director Rankin? Sorry. Yeah. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, sorry. Going. Anyway, doesn't matter. Um, I do not have any questions. Um, I am really grateful to the work of my colleagues and of the students especially. And um, in, in connection with what um, uh, Director DeWolf mentioned, you know, the uh, not having students vote, you know, there there is a process that we followed that will be open to all, all students of the uh, I think it's juniors and seniors to apply and a transparent process about how the students are selected and the student mem non-voting members they're not serving as undemocratic representatives in any way um, they are are here to give their, their voice and and i believe very fair um, as has um thoughtfully described and worked on by students themselves and um, Director Hersey and others. And apparently I'm cutting out. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'll try to fix it, but that I'm done. I don't know if you could hear me at all. Okay, Director Rivera-Smith. Thank you. Um, also, likewise, very excited about this moving forward. Um, I really enjoyed my conversation with the Youth Council. I like, like was mentioned, they did a, a meeting with each board member to share their plan and their vision. And it was exciting to see how um, how much thought have they put into it and how much intentionality is behind it. Um, and having, uh, you know, um, I know, like as people mentioned, we're not the first by any means. There's a lot of districts in our state who have done these. Um, most only have one or two, um, but we are by far the biggest district. So, I mean, it, it, it therefore, it does make sense um, to have more members. Um, I, I'm sorry I missed last meeting where we had this for intro. So I know there was probably more questions and answers than two. Um, one of my questions was regarding, um, I don't know if this was covered, but regarding um, the onboarding of the members, the, new, the student members. I know that there'll be um, an orientation with the superintendent, um, board director, and then they'll have a person, a board director, as their sort of mentor. I'm wondering, are we going to be um, offering them any other trainings, um, opportunities? And maybe they, I don't know. I think WASDA might offer some, and um, we we can make those opportunities available to them um, by way of registration, um, or again, if we're going, if we have any plans to do any of our own. Director Rivera Smith, I'm happy to answer that. From what I can share. Um, my best guess is that that's probably a conversation best suited for the procedure. So I think if you want to 
save that up and send that to Ronald as, as he likely is leading procedure development. Um, but that's a great question. Um, I think we not only want kind of the onboarding here, but if there are you know potential opportunities for student leadership growth and development, um, I think that should absolutely be part of that for sure. Great, and then the same I was going to, related to that is um, we talked about and we spoke a little bit about compensation and um, and previously in committee we talked about compensation and reimbursement types. And I'm wondering if they will have opportunities um, sort of like we do for like mileage reimbursement um, if it, when we are in person again, getting to meetings, things like that of that nature, um, or whatever other costs they might have to incur in this role. Yes, this was a conversation that came up last time. Um, I think the, prob the what we'd probably lean towards is credit earning opportunities at this point. I don't think we have developed any deeper conversations around financial compensation, um, but that has a conversation that we had with the youth. Um, but again, I think that those would be best for the procedure. But, yeah, yeah. No, again, that's I know it's forthcoming. So thank you uh, for all your work, uh, Director um, DeWolf and Director Hersey on this, and of course uh, Ronald Boy. Very exciting. No further questions. Okay, thank you, Director Harris. Uh, first of all, I'm very much in favor of this resolution and will be voting for it. I have a few concerns about the mechanics of how this will all work, but given the fact that this has such extraordinary support, we'll work it out. And I would look to uh, Executive Director Caleb Perkins and Chief Keisha Scarlett, Dr. Keisha Scarlett, to make sure that these students uh, get credit. And if we need to change bars to make sure that they do uh, in favor of doing that as well, well before they come on board. Um, without us and the extraordinary testimony that we've heard uh, shows us that we can only be stronger and better with these additional voices. And I would add to the chorus about the uncivil remarks that were made comparing this to Myanmar. That is well beyond, well beyond the uh, appropriate civil discourse in this meeting, especially, and most especially when we're speaking about our students for which we are all here. Thank you. Okay, um, and that just leaves me. I, I will just reiterate, um, I think this is an incredible opportunity to both uh, develop leadership uh, and uh, connectivity to um, governance in our students, but also to improve the quality of our decision making by having student voice, uh, not just at the, at the board level, but at the committee level. And I was um, encouraged to find out that um, the Council of Great City Schools has some incredible resources specifically related to, to student um, uh, board members. And so um, I can connect folks with, with those uh, resources so we can be putting this together with best practices and making sure that we're onboarding in a way that is um, uh, both efficient and um, and well supported uh, and, and not overburdensome to staff. So um, with that, I will ask Ms. Wilson-Jones to call for the vote. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera-Smith. Aye. Director DeWolf. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. This motion is passed unanimously. And we will now move to action item number two, approval of guiding principles for the, I'm sorry, approval of guiding principles for the buildings, technology, and academic slash athletics, BTA 5, capital V. May I have a motion for this item? Absolutely. I move that the board approve the guiding principles for the BTA 5, capital levy as attached to this board action report. 
Second. This item has been moved by Vice President Hersey and seconded by Director Rivera Smith. Now to directors for any comments or questions before we move to the vote. And I will start with the Chair of Operations, Director DeWolf. Thank you, President Hampson. Uh, we don't have any updates from introduction, but I do want to just, as, as I have a second here to, to be on the record, uh, just want to give my extreme gratitude not only to you, Board Directors and staff for the initial development of this, but then also to our uh, colleagues and partners at Seattle Education Association, Seattle uh, Council PTSA, Principals Association of Seattle Schools, and the NAAC NAACP Youth Council for their support uh, and collaboration on this as well. Uh, what you see today is the result of those conversations, and I'm really, really excited and proud where we landed on our principles. This is a really great practice. We started at BEX 5. I'm excited to see this through, and I know that our capital projects team will be really grateful to have this to guide um, and shape their discussions in the development of the BTA 5 levy. Thank you. Apologies for the delay. And we will now go to uh, Director Hersey. <clears throat> yeah, I have no uh, questions or comments ready to move forward. Director Harris. No questions. Thanks so much. Director Rivera Smith. Um, no questions. Sorry, let me turn on my camera. Um, no questions. Uh, gratitude for all the work uh, done on this, Director DeWolf. Um, working with the students to bring in the, the um, touches of um, results we're looking for. So, um, yeah, just gratitude. No, no questions. Thank you, Director Rankin. Okay, I know I got. I was cutting out before, I guess. So I switched devices. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, if it gets choppy again, I'll, I'll, I'll turn off my video. Maybe that will help. Uh, I do, what? It's a bit choppy again. Okay, I'm going to turn off my video. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I, uh, no, I mean, I've, I've, we've talked about this in committee and in introduction and um, super grateful again to um, Director DeWolf and to staff for um, pushing this back a little bit to get um, to get input and feedback from various constituent groups. Um, one thing I will say as a reminder to folks is that this will be coming before Seattle voters in February of next year. I believe somebody correct me if that's wrong, please. Um, on special ballot, it's a six year cycle. And uh, it's in addition to the how how important the guiding principles are and the considerations that are being made as we get towards that going onto the ballot, something that is weighing pretty heavily on me and that I would encourage folks to just think about related to this is the context in which we will be asking Seattle voters to approve this. Um, and uh, in related related to um, what's happening with with COVID, and um, we as during that and serving students, and a lot of this is going to, I think, I think hinge on how people are feeling about Seattle Public Schools in February, and this is a big project that funds six years of. Capital improvements, um, you know, their their uh, technology needs, a lot of really critical needs to keep our district going and serving students. Um, and so, I just kind of wanted to put that out there that it's it's within the context of what happens in the next few months that people will be considering whether or not to approve this and and the guiding principles. Thank you, Director Rankin. Uh, Director, that's it. Okay, I don't have any questions. Um, thanks again for all the uh, engagement that you did on this. I think it was um, 
uh, I'm really grateful you were able to do it, all things considered, um, and make some significant changes. So with that, Ms. Wilson-Jones, if you can please call for the vote. Director Rivera-Smith. Aye. Director DeWolf. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. This motion is passed unanimously. Thank you. Thank we you. will now move to action item number three, approval to rename Northgate Elementary School to James Baldwin Elementary School. May I have a motion for this item. Absolutely. One moment. Talking points have escaped me. There we go. I move that the school board authorize the change of the name Northgate Elementary School to James Baldwin Elementary School. This change will take effect when the new building is completed, estimated in 2022 to 2023. Second. This motion, this item has been moved by Director Hersey and seconded by Director Rivera-Smith. This item has been updated since introduction. Chief of Operations Officer, Chief Operations Officer Fred Podesta, I believe you will be briefing us on the update. Uh, thank you, President Hampson. As was discussed at introduction, um, there was consideration of the name elementary school versus James Baldwin Academy. And the board action report has been amended um, to change the proposed name to be uh, Northgate Elementary School, not um, Northgate Academy. Other, other than that, um, the uh, action before you is the same as was introduced. OK, and then um, D uh, Director DeWolf, uh, may I call on Director Chief, Nar Chief Counsel Narver to brief us on um, Yes. OK, uh, Chief Narva, can you brief us on the issues that were um, that arose related to uh, trademark infringement? Well, uh, yes, I uh, this uh, letter apparently from the uh, Baldwin family obviously just came to our attention this afternoon, but we have had an opportunity to review it. Um, I want to be careful about for privilege reasons, not giving a lot of detailed legal analysis here, but we have looked at applicable federal and state law. And I will say here that we do not believe there is any clear basis in either statute or case law, either under federal or state law, that would prohibit the district from approving this name change for one of our public schools. Thank you, Chief Narver. And now I'll go to Director DeWolf, Chief of the Operations Committee. Thank you so much, uh, President Hampson. I wanted to just offer uh, Guillermo Carvajal and if and if Didi uh, Fontelroy, our, our principal of, of this school, and then Guillermo Carvajal, who is our family support worker, if you wanted to just share any final thoughts before we move to the vote on this, I would love to hear um, just any any final remarks, if, if you're willing. He, he is, do you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, well, thank you very much for putting this to a vote. I'm really um, happy that it is put on the board and it's always up to you guys and the, the school board and our community at large that can make the decisions. And we are grateful to Elise hearing us out. At the beginning of the process of looking at changing the school name, I did go forward and communicated with James Bowen's a school in New York City. And they said that, because it was a few years back, they didn't have any information for me how to contact the family to ask them for permission or for their their blessing, more of their blessing their permission for going ahead with this. And we never were able to get in touch. And then I went ahead and tried to look at some of the information through the internet contacts for the Bowen estate. And that um, I emailed a gentleman that was in contact with them and he said he was going to put forward the, my email asking for their blessing. And that didn't go through. And then I went through the American Academy of Libraries 
and because they had, had also contact with the state and they tried several times to communicate with the family and they were not very successful with it. And I was kind of disappointed because I was very happy about and proud to have worked so hard with the community to make something so so crucial and important for our community as naming the school James Baldwin. So I really wanted a blessing, but after several months of trying, I just had to give up. But I'm still going forward, and I hope that that the community support and the school board support this. And thank you. Thanks, Karen. Principal Fontoy? Yes, and I would like to echo that. We, we pretty early on, I would say in August, had tried to multiple ways to contact the family. Um, and I think that's even in the report that we wrote that we, we did attempt several times and just had never heard back. And my understanding is that the family is, is uh, manages his literary rights, but not anything else. So uh, I, I would tend to agree that we will be okay. I, I hope that they will hear about it. I hope to invite them to come and at, at the groundbreaking and, and everything, that would be awesome. Uh, but I, I do think we can still move forward um, with this with this auspicious occasion. And um, I would like to say that, that, that the one thing that really moved me uh, when we were having a meeting about it, and we did talk to people who, who didn't necessarily agree with with our choice and and took that into consideration but the overwhelming um uh, feeling was was a positive they yes we should absolutely do this but one of my staff members who identifies as um as a person of color and and queer as well um as she was just almost in tears and said and said um this it i i just can't imagine what an amazing feeling it will be to walk into a building that is named after a person that's like me. And that's, that's the feeling we want to have at Northgate. Um, we live in so many buildings that are not named for people like us. And this is something that, that is, that's people like us and our kids can see themselves in James Baldwin. And we're really, really proud to have um, the opportunity to, to rename the school after him. Thank you so much, Principal Fontoroy. Thank you, Guillermo. I truly, truly appreciate the work that you put into this because this is outside of your normal, you know, normal scope of work and normal uh, tasks. So, you know, truly appreciate what it took to to community organize around this. And I just want to double down on what what is really important here is that this was a community effort. And, and, and you know, what, what we know on the school board is sometimes we 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 move to decisions, and not everybody's you know happy or excited, but we need to move and make the best decisions on behalf of our students and our school communities. And so I just wanna highlight some of the groups that not only did you do a, a great community engagement process, but you did also speak to community. You spoke to Haller Lake Community Club, the North Seattle Church, Somos Mujeres, Verity Credit Union, Misio Church. You had bilingual community engagement. You spoke to current families. You spoke to former families and you spoke to community members. So to say that somehow this process, you know, left voices out is, is just, it's just not fair and it's not accurate and I don't want to have that be on the record. Um, and, and the last thing I'll say is this, we are not in the business of building schools of the past that retain views of certain mountains or protect nostalgia. We are, must be focused on the future and what is best for our students. And as you shared Principal Fontoroy about that story from one of your educators who feels seen just by this small adjustment, um, those are the types of stories that really make this work critical and important. And I'm looking forward to supporting this today. And thank you for your incredible work. I can assure you this board knows what it's like to put in a ton of work. And so I just am grateful that you did this on behalf of your school community and um, going to be a really bright spot uh, on the district. So thank you so much. OK, and now we'll go to um... Director, starting with Director Hersey for comments and questions. Uh, I just want to appreciate all of the immense work that's gone into making this current moment possible. I think that as we step into, you know, for many of us or for many folks in our community, um, over the past year, there's been 
a racial awakening or a reckoning or whatever the operative word might be. Um, but what we know as black folks is that education and representation have been central to the experiences, especially as we repeatedly send our babies to these racist institutions that are schools, right? These race, these buildings that have been created with so much trauma that are, is baked into the walls and that principals like Ms. Fauntleroy have been working to create spaces that are representative that combat all of that trauma that, have, that has been built into the buildings that we call schools, right? So with this opportunity to name a school after one of the most prolific um, writers within our history, as an educator and as a black man, I find this as an opportunity that very seldom comes for us to do what I believe strongly is the right thing and give the opportunity for this school to not lose any legacy, but to continue to create a legacy at the heart of which is really to serve students. And with this change, I believe strongly that we are stepping and leading our district into a direction to where we are not only targeting our young black men, boys, our entire communities through a, a sense of targeted universalism only on paper and through policy, but we also need to do that within the monuments and, and the titles that we give the physical establishments that exist within our system. And, and that is the approach that it's going to take to undo the legacies of racism that are not only present in places like Seattle, but across our state and across our country. So I think that this is a bold move. I think that it's long overdue. And again, I'm just incredibly thankful for all of the work and the leadership from many of the folks who are on this call right now who, are, who have made this moment possible. I'm excited to move forward. Thank you. Okay, Director Harris. Uh, I will be voting for this. Um, the leadership that has been displayed by Principal Fauntleroy, not just at this school, but at several others in her career is exemplary. I am distressed, frankly, that members of the community waited until the last minute to send their negative regards and have to say that um, too little too late for this director's vote and and I'm distressed by the tone and tenor of same. Um, we got to move forward. We have to move forward and model what we want to see. And this name change is exactly that. Thank you so much. Director Vera Smith. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I echo everything already said, and I think this is an amazing effort by the community um, to, to come together um, on the, for the engagement to make this decision. Um, and regarding the emails we have received recently, um, I, I see it as kind of two different concerns. Some people are concerned about just the rebuilding of the building, you know, to get all together. And um, likewise, yeah, I, I think it's, it's not about disrespecting the past. This is about keeping our eye on the future and what is best for the students still coming and still coming for that building. Um, I, I, we, you know, we can't make our decisions on just saving everything from the past because sometimes it's not a good fit for what we need now and that school definitely is not. So I'm proud that we've made the decision to rebuild that school. Um, it, I do, you know, emphasize with, <coughs> sorry, empathize with the community who, you know, are feeling a loss um, and that's, Change, change is scary for everybody, um, but it is necessary. Um, and regarding the letter, this email that came, I'm wondering, can I ask? I don't know who's, I'm asking, I hope they can give me the answer. Is this like, we haven't verified it's a, it's a valid or, or haven't verified its authenticity, I guess, of the letter 
that supposedly comes from um, the Baldwin estate or family. Um, I'm not, I just want to get clarity on where we are with that. Um, so I, I, we have not, I don't know if, uh, Director Duell, if you want to respond to that, I mean, I, I can tell you that it could very well be there's some, um, names that seem relevant, um, but we don't, we don't know, um, with 100% certainty that, that that specific letter came from, from their state. Yeah, that's, that's all we have. Okay. Um, I just, but I do want us to be consistent. I feel like if we're going to name schools after people, we, we, we do reach out to the families and connect, um, and so I'm not trying to, again, I'm all for naming this James Baldwin uh, Elementary, no doubt. Um, I, I just do want to know that we are, you know, that we are doing, um, that we are asking, you know, making sure the families or the estates, whoever we should be asking for, you know, for lack of a better word, permission to use the name um, that we're doing next. I, I understand we do that with the other schools we rename. And, and even with, you know, the, the Billy Fink Jr. resolution we have, you know, definitely need to talk to the family before you use a person's name for something. Um, so again, this is not a hesitancy that, to use this name. I really want us to. I want to just make sure that we are consistent and thoughtful in that um, so that we can. And I, so I don't know what this means. I mean, I, I, I don't want it. Again, I'm not trying to squash this whatsoever. I'm wondering, though, um, if that's something we want to give more time to, to make sure we do connect with whoever we should be connecting on that. Um, the school's not going to be renamed for next year. So I, I'm just wondering if it's a situation. Yeah. Just as a quick response, the procedure actually says this. If the building is named after a local person, a good faith effort must be demonstrated to contact and seek input from the relatives. That's all it says. Okay. It doesn't say get information, doesn't say anything else, but you got to do your due diligence. So okay. I yeah. think we can tr we can trust our, our legal support that this is an okay thing to do. And I'm, I'll stand by that. And you know, I, I just want to know that you know we're being thoughtful. And um, again, I, this is a really hard position to be in because I I don't I, I again fully support this. Uh, I'm trying to look what schools are named as well. But um, you're okay. your sounds cutting out a little bit, Director Rivera Smith. Uh, I've said my piece. Thank you. No further. Okay. Um. Okay. So, Director Rankin. Thanks. Yeah, I'm going to, since I'm having connectivity issues still, I'm going to keep my video off um, so that I'm not cutting out. Um, I I wanted to, uh, you're making a face, Chandra. Can you hear me? I'm not making a face. That's just okay. my regular face. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. You were kind of looking like, ah, so I thought maybe it was cutting no, out again. I'm okay, just sorry. listening. Sorry. <laughs> um, I want I wanted to just note um, that the the email that we were forwarded today um, from the estate and a piece of it was read in testimony. Um, I, I wanted to give a little bit of the context of the rest of what we got in that message, which is that, you know, it does say that they've respectfully declined in the past. It also says that the estate is in the midst of a restructuring and we have suspended requests and permission for Mr. Baldwin's work at this point. Um, and that their main concern that they highlight is that if the organization moves forward with the use of the name James Baldwin, um, that they do not want his image or likeness to be used in connection with promoting the school. So I think that's that's important that they were not necessarily saying, you know, don't use the name, but um, but that image or likeness was their primary concern, which I think is a fair concern and something that can uh, you know, still be looked into and doesn't um, doesn't prevent the um, this name change today in honor of Mr. Baldwin. Um, so I will just say uh, what director Rankin just just kind of give a quick context that we are basing this on an alleged correspondence. So I just want to be really clear that we are basing it off of what we presume is correspondence from the estate. We do not have confirmation on that. So I just want to set the context. OK. Um, well, yes, and that either way, it's it's using his likeness. That's the concern. So I think I still think either way, the name is I think we're good um, above board. 
Um, I will also say, you know, um, uh, that in things like this, as as somebody who um, who has has written to us and emailed us, has said uh, that she she acknowledged that making everybody happy in a decision like this is really hard, um, and and that people want to be heard. And so I just want to acknowledge that that being heard is really important and it doesn't mean that everybody gets their way but it means that you know everybody's um, input is heard and valued and so I just want to say thank you to all of the neighbors and everybody who has written us um, even if it is not in support of this because um, you're our neighbors and you're part of the community and um, and also uh, we have also gotten so much um, so many words of support from within the walls of the Northgate School that, uh, you know, I really believe this is in the best interest of the school and, and meets with um, the wishes of the community as a whole. And, um, and so I will continue to support this and continue to look forward to working with Principal Didi and, um, and Guillermo in uh, supporting their school going through this transition. Um, and I also wanted to add uh, that something that um, Director Vera Smith said, which is that, you know, taking the old building down doesn't mean erasing the past. Um, and that, you know, as a former attendee of Laurelhurst Elementary, another old building in the Seattle Public School System, you know, it would be would be a, would be a little bit of a hurt for me to know if that building was coming down at the same time. Um, the, you know, the Northgate building, it is not, it does, it no longer serves its students as well as it used to. Um, every time it rains, I have a friend that works, that has worked there in the past that sends me a picture of the water feature when it rains and water. Down, uh, hard to regulate, just all kinds of things that make it so that I just want to make clear it's not an erasure of the past, but it's an opportunity. We have an opportunity to build better, to build better and move forward for our students in the community. And I feel really confident that they will continue to be um, good neighbors and we want to continue to hear your concerns. And thank you. If I could just add, go ahead. Hampson, if, I could just, if I could just add one more thing too, I want to just um, underscore one thing that Director Rankin said, which is. Um, an appreciation uh, for all of our neighbors, whether they're in support of this or not. And I'll just read you a quote, one of my favorite from James Baldwin, actually. And it says, I love America more than any other country in the world. And exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. You know, this, this country has a, a strong connection to discourse and dissent. And so to just underline what Director Rankin said, Yes, we always appreciate all perspectives. They're all worthy and they're all valued and they're all taken into consideration as we make our decisions. And so just offer that up as, as thanking them and still really excited to support this. Thank you, uh, Dr. Wolf. So that goes to me then. And I will just say that uh, uh, so that we can move on and, and, and vote on this. I, I feel comfortable with uh, despite the the quote unquote uh, recent development, that um, we're we're in a, a good place, we can um, look to potentially um, do outreach on uh, further with the the estate as needed um, with respect to any quotes or likeness, um, and would refrain from doing that if if we thought that was uh, at all going to uh, be be problematic. But when I think about the what the, the nature of the meaning of naming something like a building, particularly in an educational setting, um, I think it's incredibly important to uh, look to the, the future generations that will experience this building um, and then um, either in elementary to uh, maybe understand a little bit about who he was, but then later in life, to be able to look back and have that recognition of, oh, that was, you know, my school was named after this incredible, uh, just uh, brilliant. I, I struggled to even figure out what to call him um, because he represented such an intellect 
and one that I did wasn't exposed to until much later in life. And so for me, if the 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 fact that then the impact is that um, more students and more um, people in um, the, in our community are exposed to who this incredible person was and the impact that he had. Um, and I and I will, you know, then I think it's it's um, it's a really powerful thing, and that is what naming is about. And I'm so grateful to the community for for making this happen um, because he is such an important figure in America, um, in American history. And um, the I was I am grateful for the criticism um, that comes through from our our neighbors, um, as others said, even in opposition, because. Um, in this instance, it gave me the opportunity to look at some of the um, criticisms that came forward from the Catholic community that he was perceived that he was, quote unquote, anti-Catholic. And instead, what I found was this deep body of um, thought about the, the incredibly positive impact he had on the church by virtue of challenging their their racist um, pra practices and beliefs. And I didn't that was a learning for me. And so I was able to benefit simply from having somebody say, oh, he had said things that were anti-Catholic, but in fact, he had deep relationships within the Catholic community and was in um, communication with them um, about those practices. And as somebody who's seen um, Catholic missions be such a, a um, uh, mixed part of, of the history of, of this country, um, I, what I saw were, were um, folks in, in very deep thought about that, um, what they need to do internally within their own um, their own theology and their own practices to um, be accountable to to somebody like him, and that that says so much about the kind of human that he was. That even with those with whom he disagreed um, vehemently, that he's remained in conversation with them. And there, honestly, at this point in time, there is no better there's no better um, model for all of us because we are things are so tense and we are in such difficult times and that we have to be able to stay at the table and um, in deep disagreement with one another. So um, so I'm grateful for that. And with that, I will turn it over to um, Ms. Ellie Wilson-Jones to call for the vote. Director DeWolf. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Director Hersey? Aye. Director Rankin? Aye. Director Rivera Smith? Aye. Director Hampson? Aye. This motion is passed unanimously. Congratulations, Northgate. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We're so very happy. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks for being here today. Thank you. And we will invite you to the celebration to please do, <laughs> please do. We will move now to action item number four, Cleveland High School Memorial Forest Conservation Easement Agreement with King County and Memorandum of Understanding with the Cleveland High School Alumni Association. May I have a motion for this item? Absolutely. <clears throat> I move that the school board authorize the superintendent to execute a conservation easement purchase and sale agreement with King County and to execute a memorandum of understanding between the Seattle Public Schools and Cleveland High School Alumni Association in the form of draft agreements attached to the bar with any minor additions, deletions and modifications deemed necessary by the superintendent and take all necessary actions to implement these agreements. Second. This item has been moved by Vice President Hersey and seconded by Director Rivera-Smith. Now to directors for any comments or questions before we move to the vote. Starting with Director DeWolf, uh, Chair of Operations Committee. Uh, thank you, President Hampson. Um, we talked at length about this, and so I wanted to provide an opportunity for um, just to name what has been updated. Um, there is an additional document attached to this, which is the uh, Cleveland High School Alumni Association newsletter excerpt that speaks about this. So please see that as attached to the very end of this document. But overall, I just want to clarify for our audience that this is a win-win-win. 
um, for King County and their conservation goals, which supports um, addressing the climate crisis. It retains uh, Cleveland High School Alumni Association's connection, and we keep the land at, at, for the purpose of memorializing those students uh, from World War II who were connected to Cleveland High School. And the district also gains um, roughly $3.7 million, I think. So for us, we see this as a win-win-win where all parties truly did come together on a common agreement that will be beneficial to all of them. And so I'm so excited to see this come through, particularly as somebody who works in the, in the environmental world. Um, and I just wanted to quickly share, not only did the Cleveland High School Alumni Association support this, but the other partners that supported this were the American Legion, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, Daughters of the American Revolution, American uh, ex Prisoners of War, the National Association of Black Veterans, Sons of the Union Vets, Marine Corps League, and the World War II Museum, just to name a few. So I want to just thank our uh, operations staff for um, keeping your hearts and minds open to ideas. And, and this one came through, and so we're really excited to see this uh, win, win, win tonight. So I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. We'll start from the bottom of the order, Director Rankin. Um, I have no uh, no further questions or comments. Thanks to everyone, especially uh, from the Alumni Association. As as Director DeWolf said, it's a win win win, and I'm excited to vote to vote yes. Director Rivera Smith. Thank you. Um, likewise, um, no questions or comments. Just gratitude for everybody who's worked towards this. Um, can't wait to have a field trip out there someday and see the see the force ourselves. But um, thank you. No other questions or comments. Uh, Director Harris. Uh, as a proud alumni of Cleveland um, and a recipient of the alumni newsletter, I was thrilled to see that piece come out in the newsletter yesterday. This truly is a win-win-win, and with respect to the public comment, um, ironically, given the comments that the school district would mess it up, now it can never be messed up. This is uh, under King County's control with our assent and um, is there for our students to enjoy. Thank you. Director Hersey. Excited to move forward. Thank you. Uh, no, no questions for me. Just uh, thank you so much for this uh, collaboration and glad uh, to see that it um, came all came together as quickly as it did. So, um, and with that, uh, Ms. Wilson Jones, will you please call for the vote? Director DeWolf. Aye. Director Harris. Aye. Hersey. Aye. Director Rankin. Aye. Director Rivera Smith. Aye. Director Hampson. Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Okay, at an early 5.08 p.m., we've now come to the board comments section of the agenda. We'll go first to uh, Director Hersey as chair of the Audit and Finance Committee for an announcement of completed internal audit, and then we will go into general board comments. So, Director Hersey, after you've uh, read the announcement, you can go ahead into your board comments. Um, and I will double back in just a moment.
Should we um, go to the first comment while I locate the document? Sure. Okay, great. Thank you. I mean, technically it's you, but so I will go on to Director Harris. Um, thank you. I appreciate reading everyone's emails and pleas to us both uh, begging to open schools and also to um, keep them closed until certain issues are met. And I will, after having been less than happy with our Governor Inslee and our OSPI State Superintendent Reichdahl for not lifting up our teachers and school staff to a higher level of vaccine availability, will now, in fact, thank them publicly. Um, and I also would like to thank uh, the mayor for opening up new vaccination sites so that we can get our teachers and school staff in as soon as possible for the safety of everyone. Uh, big thanks to my colleagues and especially President Hampson and our facilitator for the board retreat on Saturday. I thought it was exceptionally well done. And thanks for staff that showed up. There were conversations and there was great listening to be had. I uh, am very grateful for that. I am also very cognizant of the pain and the anxiety and the fear the folks are suffering from being under the worldwide pandemic lockdown since a year ago and what a year it's been. But, but please know that I do, and I believe every one of my colleagues does, review every email and takes them to heart and, and puts them in the, the mix master, if you will, of additional information that we get and that we take it ever so very seriously. There is not enough time in the day to answer them all, but know that you are in fact being heard. And I will call out to um, the West Seattle High School community that is advocating for in-person graduations in June. Uh, I'm on your side, but there's a whole lot of details to be worked out, but um, hopefully we can do something creative and socially distanced, and hopefully we don't have an uptick in COVID cases and the different variants so that we can keep the graduates of Seattle Public Schools and their families safe. Um, again, good listening. And it's an honor and a privilege, and I thank you very much. Okay, Director Rivera-Smith. Hi, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. I think it's evening now, and thank you for joining us tonight. Um, I, I want to start by giving thanks to our chiefs and our staff who prepared and presented today and every day at the meeting. Um, we are given hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents that do not just spontaneously appear. Um, I know they're the result of hours and hours of research and compiling in collaboration with other departments and other staff. And I want you to know that you are seen and you're appreciated. Thank you for all that work every day. Um, my gratitude also goes out to our four very, very brave District 4 residents who have submitted applications to um, be considered for the seat vacated by Director Eden Mack. Um, in alphabetical order, they are Aaron Dury, Mark Perry, Lisa Marie Rivera, and Eric Souza. Um, just in applying, you have taken an incredible step towards service, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you and learning more about you and your passions, your areas of interest um, later this month at the forum. Um, as mentioned by other directors, we have received many, many, many emails um, about return to in-person learning and um, honestly, it, it's on both sides. Some say we're moving too fast and some say we're moving too slow, um, but they all have excellent points. I mean, really, there's some points that everyone has really good points and really good reasons for, for wanting 
us to slow down or speed up. Um, and I, you know, and one quote that stuck out to me, and then, and um, I know all my directors have seen these. It says, to, "We teach our children to work through their problems, to not give up when things get hard, and to look past biases and find common ground and work together where we disagree." And and um, you're absolutely right. Those the ones who shared that that's true, and I I genuinely believe that our staff and the bargaining team and the SCA, the teachers union bargaining team, are working towards that. Um, tirelessly, they we all want the same thing. We want what's best for students and get them um, safely in schools. We get them learning um, in person as needed and getting their services in person. So um, I know it takes it's a lot of faith and trust that that's happening, but it is. Um, so you know, we get again, you know, we get a lot of emails right now, and it's sometimes it's hard to you know be called failures and incompetent and lots of things in all caps, um, but. Please know that we hear you, um, and I know this isn't what you want to hear, but I want to thank you. Thank you all the parents who have written in, and all the parents and caregivers. Um, we hear your calls for desperation for returning your students. Definitely, um, as Superintendent, Superintendent Juno said, um, tomorrow marks one year since we closed the schools. And for my family, that year is actually today, because even um, just even as a board member, I didn't know when schools would close, and so. A year ago today, I kept my kids home because um, just out of concern for the safety of them and our family at home. Um, and one of them never went back. My daughter was a senior last year and never got to go back and have that final last couple months. So I absolutely uh, feel your pain and em empathize with that. Um, and we are doing what we can. We are, you know, it, it is people want to compare us to other districts and there's really no way to do that. It really is apples to oranges because even large districts, every district is unique. Not, I'm not saying it's special, but we are unique. Every district is by your schools, the age of your schools, by your transportation, by the populations you serve, the topography of uh, your city uh, that affects transportation. Everything is unique to every district. Um, so we are who we are and we it's taken the steps it's taken. We have the stakeholders we have to engage with and work very, very hard to bring our students in. Um, but we have not lost sight of all the grades. Uh, we are doing what we can to see how we are able to get everybody in safely and when we can get them in safely. Um, thank you, thank you for your emails, um, for your suggestions, for your even for your anger. Thank you for everything that you were putting into this because I know it's hard. Trust me, I know it's hard. So um, I think that's all, that's all I wanna share. Um, again, um, if you, I, I, I'll say not again, but um, I will be having hopefully a community meeting this month. I've had one every month that I've been a board member, and um, we can look out for that posted to the district website soon. Thank you. Okay, Director Rankin. I'm going to try my video. Is it choppy still? Should I turn the video off? I would turn the video off. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. I um, had a, a lot of mixed feelings this week. Um, I think we've probably all gone through times during this past year that feel very hopeful, very desperate, very, um, and all, you know, all and everything in between. And um, I had real mixed emotions at the joint press release by the district and the union. Um, I was equal parts relieved and um, and devastated, honestly. Um, so relieved that both sides have made a commitment and come together around meeting students' needs and, um, and uh, you know, touring buildings together and seeing this health and protocols that um, are, Staff has been working so hard. The tangible progress and, and that, um, you know, we are prepared um, uh, operationally. Um, the 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 feeling of devastation was for um, um, families with students who receive intensive special education services, um, and I. I know how 
the for, as I've said in other other meetings that you know there have been challenges this year for everyone, but of course you know it's not a level playing field, and those challenges have been more more acute and more impactful for some families than for others, and so um, having to delay in person services for um, special education families was a, a blow for me. Um, I, I you know ultimately I think it is beneficial and so I'm grateful um, that the decision was made and the joint statement was made um, because I think the more that um, we can be in alignment and the more um, as district and and SEA and the more um, comfort and preparedness that educators feel going into buildings, the better they will be able to provide um, the services and care and connection that um, we depend on them and love them so much for for doing um, for our students. Um, but I, uh, there's some sort of, you know, scattered talk that you know the only reason buildings are opening this year is because of pushy affluent white parents. And I just kind of want to I want to push back on that and um, encourage folks to look at the direction that we gave as a board to the district in August and again in December and again um, this was that this month the most recent one a couple weeks ago um, was with with and we made it the most clear in this most recent resolution the very clear tiering and priority of where we need to go first and who we need to design around and who in our community is is um, is is suffering the most. And so um, I, I just, I wanna say um, that students in the special education intensive service, service pathways are disproportionately, when compared to the rest of our district, they're disproportionately students of color, especially black and native students. And that when um, SPS polled families for who would wanna come back, or the original plan, uh, March 11th, who would want to come back for in-person services in the general education pre-k through one category um there was a, a over representation of white families compared to families of color who said that they would like their students to return that that discrepancy did not exist in special education intensive service pathways the way that it did in general education so i really want to caution people um, against saying that it's only affluent white families and it's only only this and only that because the students who are really um, who we are prioritizing and the students who are furthest from educational justice are students of color with disabilities. So I just really want to make that crystal clear. Um, and and in going forward too, that as we return and bargain more the return of more students, that it's still um, very focused on those who are uh, it still is very focused on equity and who has the highest number of need and how we can keep numbers and buildings low, which is which is, um, you know, the other side of balancing um, to mitigate for COVID spread. Um, so uh, thank you to everybody who is working so hard. I know that we're all um, um, doing everything and all the things and more things than we ever thought we would be doing for our own kids and for our communities and for other people's kids and um and and somehow honestly i have to say um that you know aside from a few all caps emails as <laughs> director Vera smith said that for the most part individuals on all sides of the bargaining table and in all all area of um stakeholder and community member in seattle public schools I have not encountered anyone who is not still as upbeat as they can be and thinking about our students on an individual basis and really just like nobody has given up. Nobody is giving up. And um, I just thank you everybody for that because I know how tired we all are. Um, and uh, I will just, I will end with that. Okay, I'm going to go back up to uh, Director Hersey, and then we'll go back down to Director Dwolf. Great, thank you. 
Um, so, in response to the announcement of um, our earlier mention, Board Procedures 6550 BP Internal Audit requires an announcement of completed internal audits. As the Audit and Finance Committee Chair, I am announcing that at the March 2nd Quarterly Audit and Finance Committee meeting, the Office of Internal Audit presented three follow up audit reports segregation of duties related to disbursements, segregation of duties related to human resources, and status of prior capital findings and recommendations. All findings and recommendations are discussed at Public Audit and Finance Committee meeting, and the completed reports are available online at the Office of Internal Audit's public webpage. Click on Department and Services under the Directory tab, then click on Internal Audit. Okay, so as for my director comments, I will keep them fairly short. Um, let me get my camera on. Just make sure. Okay, fantastic. So yeah, thank you so much to everybody who <clears throat> was able to join for public comment today and those of you who are listening at home. Um, this is a tough week for me, especially just because as many of you know, I'm an educator down in Federal Way and we are preparing to reopen our building to um, K and first graders um, in the next few days. And so with that, last week we said goodbye to our students um, who we had been um, working with for the entirety of the year because even for second grade um, depending on whether a family elected to stay remote or to return to the physical school um, there was no way that we would have been able to manage keeping everyone in the same classroom so when you really realize and take a moment to appreciate everything that comes with the process of reopening those those withdrawals that this process will take on people are not insignificant there have been even even though online learning environments in no way can be compared to what we get when we spend time with one another in physical space the the amount of work and effort and, and just sheer time and, and commitment that our educators and so many other folks throughout our system have put into cultivating really beautiful classrooms virtually, those are all things that we are going to have to take into consideration as this transition begins. And so what I would just urge you to do if you are a parent listening at home is take a moment and sit down with your child and have a conversation about change and have a conversation about how how this this insane time that we are all living through is impacting them and as we get closer and closer to return to some sense of normalcy this is not going to be an insignificant transition and and i'm seeing it on the faces of my second graders in real time so please take that opportunity and talk with your kids about how things are going to look very different over the next few weeks as things begin to reopen and more of us get vaccinated and the CDC uh, releases less and less strenuous guidance. Um, what I will say is that as an educator in seeing um, the work that our district is putting in with our labor partner, the Seattle Education Association, I'm very hopeful. And I know that for many families out there knowing that we are going to have to wait even just a few weeks longer is is wholly untenable. But in the in this grand scheme of ensuring that we can reopen our buildings in partnership and in genuine collaboration with our education association, it's gonna set us up better on what will be a very long and arduous recovery process to to get us to where we can say, okay, we have taken we have taken everything that we've learned from this pandemic, and we are now applying um, supports to help our students achieve a place of understanding where they can say, okay, now I can exhale. Um, and that's going to take years. So making sure that this first initial step that we put forward is one that is on the basis founded in collaboration and mutual understanding is critical. And the time that it takes is the time that it takes. And so as we move forward, 
just know that the investments that we are making right now to make sure that we are getting in a contract that is fair and equitable and solid, not only for our educators, but for our students and our system as a whole, we are going to benefit from exponentially as we start to have greater conversations about what reopening our entire system looks like. So again, we cannot rush this process because we have to do it right. Um, thank you for everyone again who has spent time with us. I hope you and your families are well, and I will see you next time. We can pass it on to the next director. Thank you. Thank you, Director uh, DeWolf. Thank you, President Hampson. Uh, I'll keep my remarks brief tonight, but I just wanted to again lift up my hands to the NAACP Youth Council for the incredible work and the opportunity to work together over the course of the last few months on a student uh, rep policy, which the board approved today. So thank you to that for that. And I hope our, our young folks and our students are, are listening tonight because this is a huge deal. I'm very excited about this development. Um, I also want to just kind of tag on a little bit to Vice President Hersey to also just say that, you know, what is really important is that um, at the end of the day, our educators are doing incredible work. And you know this, this experience uh, of them advocating to ensure that our buildings are safe to return um, is a minor issue um, in comparison to the incredible work that they've done over the course of this whole pandemic, basically shifting their understanding and their approach and how they teach. And so I don't want any of that to get lost in these conversations because I think it's really easy to focus on attention right now. But the tension is actually where the good work is, is happening and people are you know are coming to terms and, and, and finding the places where there's agreement and, and we can able so we are able to move forward together um, collectively with each other's best interests at heart. So I just want to make sure that folks and particularly in our community really recognizes that teachers at the end of the day have been doing incredible work. They do incredible work, and I want to. And I, don't, I don't want us to lose sight of that. Uh, and before you know, the only last thing I'll just mention today uh, is just end with a quote from James Baldwin as we were able to approve uh, the name change of Northgate. The paradox of education is precisely this: that as one begins to become conscious, one begins to examine the society in which he is being educated. I think if we can raise and educate our young people to examine their own understanding of the world and, and, and the society in which they're being educated is an incredible thing. And I would be really proud if our students um, took the lead uh, and the model of James Baldwin in that approach. Thank you, President Hampson. Thank you. Um, so just uh, quickly, uh, we had a nice uh, walk in uh, the Arboretum uh, for my weekly uh, uh, walk in the Park with uh, Director Hampson uh, or walk in the park with Chandra, whichever you prefer. Um, Thursdays at 11 a.m. Uh, this Thursday will be at the Center for Urban Horticulture and it's on my Facebook page and you can uh, message there or text and uh, we usually wait about five minutes and then start five to ten minutes and start walking. So send me a message if you're planning to join us, um, particularly as the weather gets better. Uh, it's a really good time to get out masked and socially distanced and um, have these conversations um, and, and do some things that are healthy for us as well. Um, so, so practicing what I preach and the things that I, that I try to tell my kids that they have to get out of the house and get some light and some um, light on their, on their eyes and, and fresh air in their, in their noses and, and be moving. Um, and, and thank you to everybody that came out last week because it was a um, it lifted my spirits as, as well. And I um, uh, appreciate being able to have those conversations in person in a different environment. Um, pretty major week and I, I have tremendous uh, gratitude for everyone that is in bargaining. I can't emphasize enough how difficult uh, that process is. Um, you know, we have one of the, we're top three uh, in terms of um, pro-union, strong union laws in, in the state. And, and I think, you know, that's something that, and that Seattle's pretty proud of. Um, I think it makes for really strange bedfellows in the midst of a pandemic. And so to have um, colleagues and um, people who have, have worked together in all manner of, of um, relationship throughout their their time in the district um, sitting across from each other and debating over 
um, some really fine details relative to how we operate um, in workspaces in the during this pandemic is um, it, it is a tough lift and I'm grateful to uh, the collaboration that that they have um, shown this week and I'm hopeful um, and I am uh, had the opportunity to call parents directly uh, today to talk to them to apologize for the delay from the 11th to the 29th and uh, those are families uh, specifically the ones that I spoke with um, that are whose students are in intensive service pathways and those are very hard conversations um, very enlightening conversations um, and anytime I have one of those conversations and I so appreciate each of those families taking time to speak with me and tell me about their child and their their family and their experiences and what's important to them and um, uh, it helps me it helps inform me in every case and in each case there is a tremendous amount of, of understanding paired with a just incredible amount of sadness and frustration and um, I, I don't think that, you know, we, we are in a place where we truly just have to hold those things at the same time and uh, keep moving forward and, and hope that um, uh, as I experienced when I dropped my, my kids off at their first softball practice um, after having to shut down my own team's softball um, uh, activities a year ago, um, I felt a sense of of hope that we are coming out of this. Um, you know, a year ago, having practiced for, um, gotten all of our practices in and about to get to our, our first games and then had to um, had to shut it all down. And that was, um, you know, I, it's not the same as, as Director Hersey's experiences having been with his students all year long, but, but you know, when you, when you work with kids and, and you're um, ready to see them go out and, and really, um, Put in their best effort. Uh, it's it's tragic when that doesn't happen, and um, to to see some of those same kids out there. Um, I don't get to coach, but they've. I'm grateful to um, shout out to Mike Walker and Eric Knutson for keeping the the league, the softball league, going and and providing coaching for those um, for those teams so that that um, my girls and others can be out there in the sunshine and. Um, um, and, and doing some healthy activities. Um, we definitely have more tough days ahead. And, um, but I do hope that this is um, an upward trajectory that we have in fact turned a corner. And uh, with the incredible amount of, of frustration, um, I hope that we, the thing that I ask for families to consider um, with all of that is, you know, that we all just take that time to hold both of those things at the same time, that while there has been loss, there's also been growth. Um, I heard that from the families that I spoke to, they, that, that whose students are in intensive service pathways, that they've focused on the growth that they've um, been able to have together as a family, even where there has been significant regression and loss. Um, and and so that you talk about those things with your children as well, that the changes ahead and you talk about the, the loss and the, the, the growth of the new things, the growth and the new things that they've learned. And then and then to let us know what we need to know for them to let their teachers know and their um, uh, their their parents and and for um, for you all to let us know the things that we need to know about your students as we start to build out this next year. Um, we have a a massive schedule ahead of us to make that happen and a lot of transitions. Um, and uh, I hope that we can work to improve our communications. I think that's sort of for me being the theme of the week all along the way is where we have fallen down from the standpoint of communication. Uh, and we, we definitely need to do much, much better. And so that's kind of what I'm gonna be. In addition to our best practices at the board level and introducing some of those things to the community with much greater focus, in our planning uh, that we can collaborate um, together on significantly better, more streamlined and, and clear communication. Um, and with that, if I didn't miss anything or anyone, uh, there being no further business to come before the board, the regular board meeting is now adjourned at 5.39 p.m. Pina Thanks everyone.